Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Hey, welcome. So glad that you're here as we continue on in this series that we're calling Path to Purpose, looking at Abraham's life. And what an interesting life it is that we're studying, right? So why don't you take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 16. And if you need a Bible, you can just uh, wave uh, at one of the ushers coming in all our rooms, and they'll be glad to let you borrow um, one of those Bibles. You can keep it if you need a Bible. So... um, I can tell you this much, it wasn't my best moment. Suzanne was 34 weeks pregnant with our younger son, William, who just recently turned 11 several weeks ago. I was trying to keep her uh, comfortable and uh, handling all the extra chores and all that husbands do when their wives are pregnant. When on a hot, humid, Sunday afternoon in August, our home's air conditioning conked out. So I called the, uh, the AC company that uh, we had a VIP agreement with, $199 extra. I paid for that agreement. And I expected that they would say, well, hello, Mr. Werlein, you are a VIP. And we'll just be out in a jiffy. But that's not what she said. The lady on the other line said, I'm sorry, sir, but it's Sunday and we have a smaller crew than normal. And the soonest that we're going to be able to have anybody out there is sometime tomorrow. And something inside of me snapped in that moment. I was looking at my wife who was sweating and feeling very much like she was going to pop. I had just preached three or four times that day back before we had two rooms and had all those morning services. Uh, I was exhausted and I had no interest in waiting whatsoever. And so I said to her, now you listen to me. I'm one of your VIP people. I paid $199 for that VIP treatment and so right about now is a good time for you to come through with some of that VIP treatment. What you just told me is unacceptable. She said, Mr. Warline, again, I'm sorry, um, but we just, we have a smaller, she started in that, and, and at that point, I just lost it, and I said, wrong answer, and I hung up. And right about then, Suzanne looked across at me from sofa she was sitting in and says, hmm, sure you handled that the right way. Well, it was several months later, and my assistant handed me an email. She said, I think you'll have to work on this one yourself. It said, uh, please remove my name from the Faith Bridge rolls, for I'll not be coming back. Several months ago, Pastor Ken called the air conditioning company where I work, and though I never realized who he was, who, though he never realized who I was, I certainly knew who he was. But after the way he spoke to me that evening, I don't think I could ever again listen to him preach. Talk about a gut punch, humiliation, embarrassment. Um, I just felt terrible. And so I, I went straight into my office and sat down at the desk and looked up her phone number and dialed the number to apologize, but there was no answer. And so I left a message, but she never called back. So I sent an email or two and she never replied. And I was reminded that our worst choices made in weak moments can bring long-lasting consequences, can't they? I mention that because it's exactly where Abraham finds himself in the text that we're going to take up today in Genesis chapter 16. Now, if you've just been coming, maybe today's your first time, let me just sort of recap the series that we're kind of right in the middle of here on Abraham so that you can have just a 60-second sort of orientation. It's a story about a man who occurs and shows up in the Bible, but we don't learn anything about him until he's 75. And that's when we first meet him. His wife is 65. His name's going to be Abraham. Her name's going to be Sarah. But when we meet him at the start of the story, she is Sarai and he is Abram. 
And really, there's no more central a person in all the religious world than Abraham, as the video just made clear, because Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all look back to Abraham as the patriarch for our faith, the model of courageous, authentic, faithful living. But today, we're going to see that this hero of the faith, Abram, was made of nothing any more special than what you and I are made of. And so Christians and Jews don't particularly like chapter 16 because of what it says about our patriarch. And Muslims don't like it either because of how it says their people came about. So at the age of 75, uh, remember, God met Abraham and he said, I'm choosing you and you're going to be my man. You're going to be a father. I'm going to give you offspring. I'm going to make you into a great nation and those who bless you, I will bless and those who curse you, I will curse. And this was shocking. It's certainly shocking to him, but it's really shocking when you just do the biblical study yourself and you go back and you realize what made him so special. Nothing made him so special. He was just an ordinary old backwoods kind of guy living down in not too far from modern day Baghdad. He was a nomad and he worshiped the moon god. There was nothing particularly special about him until God got a hold of him. And at that point, everything changed in his life and he trusted God and he followed God. And he and Sarah moved because God said, but for all of this to happen, you're gonna to have to move out of Ur of the Chaldeans. I need you to move to this special place that I have for you. That we call the promised land in Canaan, that's Northern Israel. And so they've made that long journey. And now by the time we get to chapter 16, 10 years have gone by. They've been living with this promise of the baby, but there's been no baby, which is kind of strange because don't you know that they've been thinking, well, now we did our part. I mean, we like, we moved and everything. And when are you going to bring that baby, that promise that you've been talking about? And what made it really awkward, I'm sure, is that remember what we talked about several weeks ago, Abram, the name Abram meant daddy. Now daddy is 85, but daddy got no kids. So don't you know, he felt a little awkward every morning when he reached up to the cupboard in the kitchen, he pulled out the coffee mug that Sarah had bought him 10 years earlier that said, daddy. And I bet as he drank that coffee, he was sometimes thinking, maybe I'll just throw this cup away and get myself a new mug. Because there he was with no kids. And if he was taking it hard, you know, you can know Sarah was taking it hard. Because in those days, 4,000 years ago, women had no other purpose but to bear children. We know better now. Okay? I'm telling you what history was. 4,000 years ago, back then, they thought that all a woman was good for was having children. And so barrenness was just not much better than death. And so this is the context that we come into chapter 16 with. Let's read it. Verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so go and sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, Hagar began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, you're responsible for this wrong that I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do, you do with her whatever you think is best. And Sarai mistreated Hagar, and she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? Where are you going? She answered, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I'll increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you're not pregnant, 
You'll give birth to a son. You'll name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he'll live in hostility toward all his brothers. And she gave a name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. This is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It's still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar born him, bore him Ishmael. So there's a lot to cover here, right? Starts out, Sarah, she's fed up with her infertility. And so she grabs the gears of control and suggests, look, I got a slave, so anything that belongs to her belongs to me. I'll just have a child for you through her. Why? Why was she thinking this? Because look at verse 2. The Lord has kept me from having children. What is the psychology that's going on beneath the surface there? Well, I'll tell you. In a roundabout way, she was saying, it's God's fault. It's all God's fault that I'm not having any children. Which makes you wonder if maybe she hadn't been listening to the whispers of the devil, the enemy who'd come along whispering things like to her, Sarai, maybe God doesn't really love you like he loves Abram. Sarai, if God really loved you, then wouldn't things be different right now? What if God is actually preventing you from the blessing of childbirth? Remember how the enemy got Eve back in Genesis chapter 3, 13 chapters earlier in Genesis 3, wondering if maybe when God had said to Adam and Eve, all of this garden is yours, except you can just only one thing you can't eat, and that's of this tree. And then what did the enemy come along and get Eve wondering? Has Maybe, is he holding back on us? Because maybe that's really the only good thing. And, and maybe he really is trying to keep the good stuff from us. And they took that fruit. And so you can see the devil's been committed to stealing and killing and destroying ever since the beginning. And now he has Sarah calculating how she could take matters into her own hands and, well, you know, help God out with his plan because clearly he's not getting the job done on his own. And I wonder, have you ever done that? Have you ever been tempted to grab the gears of control yourself, take matters into your own hands? If so, say hello to Sarai. That's what she was doing. She had a plan, but the only problem was it wasn't God's plan. It wasn't God's way. It wasn't God's time. But she pushes it anyhow and says, Abram, let's face the facts. I'm 75, you're 85. I'm not getting the job done for you. God's promised us this child of promise. And so how about my servant Hagar? Notice Abram's response. Verse two says he agreed to what Abram said. The ESV really translates this with a better way. It says, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And you know something? When things aren't working the way that we want them to work, it's always easier to listen to somebody else's voice than to God's, isn't it? That's exactly what he does. He listens to Sarai. Incidentally, this use of a secondary wife for infertility issues back then, um, it, was, it was very common. It was considered acceptable. It was legal, as a matter of fact. But just because something is culturally acceptable, or even if it's been legalized, does that make it into God's will? No. And this is why, although we see polygamy here and in many other places in the Old Testament, the Old Testament also makes entirely clear that never once does it work out happily. Every single time 
is a damnable mess because God only ever intended for sexuality to be experienced in the context of a monogamous, loving, male, female, married relationship. But what about if, you know, with the changing times, people are using sex in this way or that way now? What about now? No. Well, what about if it's, if it's legal even to do it a different way now? No, don't listen to the words of others. Stand on the word of God if you, want your, if you want your life to work rightly. Oh, that Abram had stood on the word of God, that he'd stood strong in his faith instead of giving into the fears of Sarai and her frustrations. And so we picture the scene. It's awkward to picture, really, as you imagine Abram saying to Sarai as he closes the bedroom door, to have some privacy with Hagar. Um, well, we'll be out in a little while. And remember, I'm, I'm just doing this for you, babe. That's awkward. And the Bible says she conceives. So you think, well, Sarah's happy, right? Wrong, because that's... Not the way it turned out. She got what she'd wanted, but now she's hacked. And as Hagar's belly bump gets bigger by the week, Sarah gets madder and madder. Why? Verse 5 tells us that Hagar began showing contempt towards Sarai. Though it doesn't tell us exactly how this manifested, so I've been trying to imagine, well, how did she show this contempt towards her Master Sarai. I wonder if maybe one evening when Sarai said, Hagar, would you please go ahead and make some dinner for Abram and me? Maybe that night she said, um, no. Because <laughs> see, um, I'm feeling a little pregnant. And uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Abram, do you want to come over here and, and just put your hand right here and Feel your child of promise inside of me. We don't know exactly how she did it, but whatever she was doing, it was making Sarai mad. Maybe Sarai was, uh, maybe Hagar was figuring, this is my ticket out of slavery. Maybe somehow I'll step in now as the mother of many nations. We don't know exactly, but we do know that Sarah was feeling more out of control than when the whole story started when she was just childless. Mark this down, friends. Mark this down. Things never get better. They always get worse. When we grab the gears of control in our own hands and we try to force on the God's drafting table, our plans. Notice, God isn't even mentioned in verses one through four. You don't even see the Lord show up until verse five, which as Pastor uh, Chris Brown points out, is probably a good point for us to observe. And that is that most of us don't consult God in verses one through four of our lives. It's not till things go off the rail in verse five that we're like, God, where are you now? So a gal starts hanging out with a guy. She knows he's not the right guy. She knows he doesn't love Jesus, not a believer. He's definitely not Mr. Right, but he can, can be Mr. Right now. And plus sometimes just the Netflix and chills just kind of feels good with somebody, right? But it goes on and she continues to spend time with him and over and over now she's realizing what the world is going on I've been over my head and you're like God help me or maybe for you it started out with with some flirtation in the office place and then one thing and another now you're you're you've gotten yourself into an extramarital affair and you're like oh my god what god help or maybe it's a financial thing in verses one through four of your life, you never didn't think much about that. I mean, you sort of took it for granted. And, and then one day there's an economic downturn or there's a layoff and it's you 
or some other shocker. And now you're like, oh God, what are we gonna do? Or maybe it's your health. You took that for granted. And we all tend to, right? We don't consider God too much in verses one through four when things are happy and healthy. But then one day the doctor sits down with an earnest look and looks into our eyes and says, we've got to have a talk because it's not good news. And in that moment, we're like, oh no, God, God, where are you? It's in verse five. If only we could get God in verse five up before we tried to push through verses one through four on our own, huh? Well, Proverbs 19.3 says, a person follows their own path till it fails. And then they turn to God. Sarai says to Abram, Hagar despises me and I'm suffering because of this. So let the Lord God judge between you and me, Abram. Now, she does have a point in that there's plenty of fault to go around here. She can't bear all the blame herself because Abram should have stood strong when she proposed this plan of the, the Hagar solution to him. He, sh he should have said, Sarai, settle down, calm down. Let's not force things. Let's trust God this time. Didn't we learn something along these lines when we went to Egypt 10 years ago and we tried to solve things on our own? But Abram took no stand. So he has to bear his share of the blame here. So Sarah says, do something about Hagar. And he's like, she's your servant. You do to her whatever you think is best. And so she does. And our English translation pretties this up. It says that she mistreated Hagar. Well, if you get in the original language, the Hebrew, the word is actually the same word for what the Egyptians did to the Jewish slaves, beating. So now Sarah's becoming abusive and she's beating Hagar. And so Hagar does the only sensible thing and she flees. She just takes off and running for her life now. A single slave, pregnant girl in a foreign land trying to figure out how do I get back home to Egypt? Which brings us to the sweetest part of the whole chapter. Look at verse seven. Who does it say she met? Does it say she met an angel of the Lord? No. She didn't meet just an angel of the Lord. Although for the record, if I ever got to meet an angel of the Lord, I still think that would be amazing and totally cool. But that's not just who she got to meet. The text says she met the angel of the Lord. And in the Old Testament, wherever the angel of the Lord shows up, it's signaling to us the pre incarnate Christ. 2,000 years before he would come into the world as our Savior. You're like, but he wasn't around then. Oh, yes, he was around then. Remember John chapter 1 in the very beginning? It says the word was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the very beginning. And here he is making a cameo appearance, making, taking a human form and being visible to show up and meet Hagar. Hagar. He says, I know who you are. I know your name. Hagar, I know everything that's happened to you. You're a slave. You were deported from Egypt to Canaan. You've been made to sleep with your master, Abraham. You've been impregnated. You've been beaten by Sarah. You're fleeing for your life to Egypt, and you're wondering how, how you're going to make it on your own. I know. Don't miss the tenderness of this. God meets her in her misery as she's running. And you know something? He still meets us in our misery as we're running. God meets us on the run and he knows your name. 
and he knows who you are and he knows what you've been through and he can take all of those things and he can work them together no matter how bad they are he can work them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes how do we know that this is so true oh because this same savior would come finally and fully 2,000 years after this scene and make himself known to the whole world by taking the very nature of a servant and being born in human form. He came into the world so that he could live the life of sinless perfection that none of us can live, qualifying him to die the death of punishment that all of us deserved to die so that he could rise triumphantly on the third day, conquering the grave and signaling to all of us, if you're connected to me, then you can have life and the assurance of promise and abundance and peace and my presence in your life. That's how we know. But 2,000 years earlier, how gracious of him to show up to this fearful, fleeing, pregnant slave no less than how he would come for the rest of us to know him 2,000 years later. He says, Hagar, I can still do something great here. I can make beauty from ashes. You're going to have a son. In verse 11, you're going to name him Ishmael. Incidentally, it's the first time in the Bible God preloads a name into, you'll see this several more times in the Bible, but, but this is the first time where he says, you're going to give him this name, Ishmael. He also says, you're going to have to stop running, Hagar. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do the most counterintuitive thing. I'm going to ask you to turn around, go back to the mess, go back to Sarai and Abram, be obedient, and see if I don't pour out blessings beyond your wildest expectations, Hagar. But here's the thing, Hagar, the blessings will only come as you maintain your connection to Abram. You've got to go back. Now, God also told Hagar this truth. Ishmael is going to be a freedom-loving nomad. He's going to be a bit of a wild man. He's going to be hostile to all nations. But at the same time, Ishmael's going to be the father of an entire Arab nation. And Genesis 25, 12 through 18 is going to confirm that his descendants, Ishmael's descendants, did indeed multiply into that great nation, just as God had told Hagar it would happen. Incidentally, some of you are trying to connect a couple of dots. Let me help you to connect those dots right now. One of those Bedouin Arab descendants of Ishmael 2,600 years later would be a man named Muhammad, the founder of Islam, which we're going to talk more about in a, a series that I'm going to do in January. So I won't say more about that now other than to say Muhammad um, will indeed, centuries later, look back to this story as he goes back upstream into the history of the headwaters of the Arab people to Abraham, his ultimate forefather, who with Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. So Hagar's head, don't you know, it's spinning. She's talking to the Lord right here face to face. He's just told her, you're going to have a child. It's going to be Ishmael. You're going to actually be uh, the mother of, of uh, he's going to be father of a whole nation. I mean, this, this is a lot of stuff to metabolize. And here comes the most touching part of the whole chapter, verse 14. She gives a name to God. In the Hebrew, it's El Roy. Not El Roy like American Elroy, not that, but <laughs> El Roy, the God who sees me. You're the God who sees me, she was saying. And, and in so doing, what she was saying is, from now on, no matter what other names are your names, I'm always going to know you, God. It's the God who saw me. 
You saw me in my running. You saw me in my affliction. You saw me in my misery. And you know what? He's still El Roy to you. This is particularly pertinent, don't you realize? If you've ever been hurt yourself, if you've ever been on the run yourself, if you've ever been victimized yourself, if you're a single mom yourself, God can be for you exactly who he was for Hagar, El Roy, the God who sees me in my affliction. He'll meet you there. He'll meet you in that affliction, which let's be clear is not to say that then he uh, spares us all of the consequences of sin and evil. No, he does not do that. The consequences still come downstream, even when the sin wasn't done um, by us, but, but to us. Ishmael, for example, is going to still be a wild man. But you think about it, how could he not be? Because forever he's going to struggle with, you know, this inferiority complex and all these Freudian things years before Freud is ever going to come along. Because he's going to struggle knowing that Isaac, the younger brother who'd come 14 years later, was really going to be the child of promise to get his father's blessing and for that matter, the consequence of Sarah's and Abram's impatient choice to go for the Hagar solution. Well, it was going to act- activate a whole river of consequences that still flows today, 4,000 years later, as evidenced by the never ending Israeli Arab conflict. But see, this text is also telling us that no matter what the consequences that we have to bear, he is our. El Roy, our God who sees us in our affliction and who meets us there. And some of you, I just have a feeling you need to hear that because you've been dealing with consequences for years since that night when you were 19 years old. Others of you, you've been dealing with consequences for the last five or 10 or 15 years. Perhaps just even from a choice that wasn't, it was just almost momentary. But don't miss it today. God says, well, the consequences still are going to flow downstream, but I can meet you in the midst of them. So even if you got off path A and you're on path B or path C, or maybe you're on the path D or E, or maybe you're on the path X or Y or path Z, I can meet you on any path and I can put my arm around you and I can bring you back into the fold by my amazing grace. And this, friends, is the good news. He says, I can meet you in that affliction. And I can bring you back. So with God, Hagar goes back to Canaan. And apparently she makes some sort of amends and submits herself to Sarai's leadership. We know this because they don't have conflict, at least for another 14 years. Perhaps now, both of these women were just a little bit more in touch with their shortfallenness and a little bit more aware of God's Amazing grace. Well, that's how it was for Nicole. God saw her in her own affliction, in her own suffering, but he met her in those afflictions. And that's when everything began to change for her. Well, take a look at the screens and you can let Nicole tell her own story. When I was 14 years old, I found out that I was pregnant. And I was terrified to tell my parents, you know, like, I love babies and I love kids. And so in my mind, if you get pregnant, you have a baby because you love babies and you love kids. My parents weren't supportive of me keeping the baby and they put a lot of pressure on me to have an abortion. I remember feeling that that's not what I really wanted, but I was doing what I felt like I had to do. I don't, I didn't know God at the time. 
And at that point, I felt so separated and far from God. And I think he was probably crying with me that, you know, that that choice, that my decision grieved him. Um, and I know in that moment, he would have forgiven me. I know, you know, I know that he would have been a loving, merciful father, because that's who he is. My high school years were extremely hard. They were extremely hard. I had no way of expressing how I was feeling. I was just holding it in. I, w I didn't tell any of my friends because I was ashamed. And I didn't tell my parents who knew about it because, you know, I think, I think we all just wanted to forget about it. Becoming a Christian, like, dramatically changed my life. But I think the biggest thing that had me, like, you know, in bondage was just that, that shame and that guilt. I mean, I never talked about my abortion. It was just all like bound up inside and pushed down and suppressed. I help lead a, a post-abortion Bible study for anybody who wants to receive healing from their abortion. I know for me, like it helped me with guilt and shame and receiving God's forgiveness. I was able to express those feelings and get those feelings out and not have to push them down and suppress them anymore. I think before I went through this study, there was a part of me that didn't even realize that I needed healing. There was a part of me that felt I was just dealing with it the best that I could. Through the study, um, I was able to forgive uh, my parents for their part in it. Once I had healings in it, then I was able to go and talk to them about it, to just share our hearts with each other, you know, and to ask each other for forgiveness, you know, for them to ask me and for me to ask them. So I certainly was not um, the perfect child. And so I had a lot to, to ask them to forgive me for. You know, and my dad said, if I could go back, I would say, let's have the baby. And, you know, just to hear those words, um, you know, for me, it really, it meant a lot. And then, you know, my mom, she's a volunteer at CareNet. She volunteers as a care staff volunteer. So she's in the appointment rooms with, you know, ladies who are considering abortion. To me, like, that speaks volumes that, you know, the whole family has been healed through this Bible study. I had never imagined that God would bring me to this place. Like, I always felt like I was just gonna stay in that place of, like, zip your lips and keep it in and I never thought that I would have just the freedom to be able to talk about it openly. I want to share that message with everyone that, you know, if God can do this for me, he can do it for you. You know, it's just a such an awesome, you know, ministry and just to watch how God changes people's lives. It's a miracle, but at the same time it's a miracle that he can do in any any woman's life too. I knew that God had something for me, but I was like, I could never talk about my abortion like publicly, open, you know, like that'll, God could never do that for me. And I was so wrong. <laughs>
And so that's what we're going to do here in these final minutes. And my prayer this week has been not that we'll just sort of file through uh, sort of like, you know, cattle to the trough, but that we would come individually and really have a moment with the Lord. That even as we take the gluten-free cracker and dip it into the cup and partake, we would feel his presence. I've heard the most touching stories over the years of people who are like, there was something that happened when I came to the Lord's Supper. Is that weird? No, it's not weird. It's why we call it a sacred moment or a sacrament. Because through these elements, he just sort of makes his grace a little bit more tangible. And so as you come, the ushers will lead you in both of our rooms and in Center Court West in the balcony, they'll have stations for you. You just follow their lead and you'll come, you'll take the elements. If you, after you partake, if you want to kneel on one of the steps, we're going to turn the steps into our prayer altar. You just feel free to stay and pray as you feel led. And we'll have some prayer partners at the front as well. If you'd like someone to pray with you or over you about something as well. Meanwhile, our worship leaders will be leading us and we'll be singing and just worshiping God as we come. Let's pray together. Now, Lord, won't you meet with us? Won't you come with the power of your Holy Spirit? And won't you infuse us with life and hope and with your grace that we might leave here with a whole new outlook transformed? We pray all of these things in your strong name, Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Good afternoon and welcome to Postscript. My name is Tyler Riley, high school pastor here with Ken Warline, uh, who just gave a very impactful message um, in the series Path to Purpose. And so, Ken, first off, thanks for being here with us today and sitting down with us. Um, and I figure we could just jump right into some of these questions. Let's do it. Awesome. So the first is this. How are we to know if there is a decision we're making that's not part of God's plan? Like what if God wants us to take something in our own hands and make a decision? How do we know when God is telling us to follow what he has set up? Right. So we don't end up like an Abram in this story and Sarah. So, well, let's keep in mind, we've got uh, some advantages uh, to Abram and Sarah. Remember, we now live on, 4,000 years later, the back end of all of biblical history. And it's all recorded for us in God's word. And so you remember the Bible hadn't been written. I mean, we're just up to chapter 16 of the, like the very beginning. And so they didn't have God's word to lean upon. That's number one. I would say, let's go to God's word and say, okay, is there anything about what we're trying to decide that God's word would give clarity on? If we're violating the premises uh, or, or principles of God's word, then we know that's, that's off. That, that has to be a no. Um, if we're not, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll be a yes, but let's go further. That would lead to, I think, the second thing um, that we have, and that is the leading of his Holy Spirit. We enjoy the benefit of God's Holy Spirit living inside of us if we're believers. And the Holy Spirit does show up some in the Old Testament, but he sort of just drops in for these cameo experiences uh, appearances, uh, unlike after Acts chapter 2 when he comes for all of us. And so this is where we have to learn how to discern with God's word the leadings of the spirit. Am I feeling that peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? Or am I feeling like this is a force uh, right now? Which leads to a third thing. Check this with Christian community. Not check it with somebody who doesn't know God and who's probably going to say what you might want them to say, especially if you kind of sense the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that. Don't go to that person. Go to somebody who really knows God and knows God's word and say, hey, let me run this by you. Just check in for wisdom here. Do you think this is wise if I move forward or not? Um, 
And so these are three things that we have, the, the Bible, the Spirit, and the church, sure. that Abram and Sarai, that they were just like the start of it all. And so um, they didn't have these advantages that we would have. I would point people real quickly um, to all of those. Awesome. That's good. Um, and then the next question is this, if God really wanted to have Abram and Sarai wait for Isaac, and they did, do you think the Muslim nation would exist? That's a great question, which I haven't really thought about. And I guess I'll just have to go with a solid, I don't know. No. Um, th uh, and it probably doesn't do a whole lot of good to sit around and think about it because, the, um, but, but the, the, they did do what they did and they did have Ishmael and he did have descendants and, uh, and one of those 2,600 years later would be Muhammad and there would come Islam. Um, and, uh, but it's an interesting question. I yeah. guess we'll find out from heaven's vantage yeah. point someday. Absolutely. Um, and then the last question is this, is there such a thing as a providential will of God prevailing in our sin? Yeah, and I'm gonna interpret providential will of God as perfect will of God. Can the perfect will of God prevail when what? Read the second. It, it prevailing in our sin. It, yeah, after sin, can his perfect will prevail? I would say no, but I would chase it with a quick, but his permissive will can prevail through his grace. Now, what do we mean? Suppose um, this line is the perfect will of God, um, or we call it plan A, God's plan A. Suppose uh, we're going along, but through our sin, we drop down to plan B or plan C. Well, I guess we could say, uh, I'm out of the perfect will of God, but does that mean that I'm hopeless? No, because through Jesus, there is grace and there's hope and there's a pathway back from whatever path we've gotten ourselves onto. So some uh, people have called this the difference between the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. Both are all of God and both are full of grace. The benefit to plan A, to the extent that we can stay on that path, is that I believe generally there's fewer consequences. Path B and C and D and E and F, we can pick up some, some consequences uh, that come dragging along behind us, which doesn't mean that his grace is not still available for us. No, no, it's, 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 it's plenty available, fully available, but the consequences do uh, still come. And so the, 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 to the extent that we can preclude uh, picking up those all the better. Well, great. That is all the questions that we have for this week. So thanks for sitting down with us. Um, and thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.